Hello, I'm Graham McTavish, and I've come here to rural Warwickshire in the heart of England to explore the background to one of the most famous works of literature in the world, The Lord of the Rings. J.R.R. Tolkien's great work has its roots firmly set in this landscape. This is where Tolkien grew up, and it is these fields and farms which form the inspiration for the Shire from which the whole adventure begins. The Hobbits, of course, are modelled on the ordinary men and women who populated this landscape around 100 years ago. From 1925 until 1959, Tolkien was first a professor of Old English and later professor of English language and literature at Oxford University. It's no surprise that Tolkien should come to specialise in language. He had a, an innate understanding for language and a brilliant flair for learning and deconstructing ancient and medieval languages. I mean, as well as Greek, Latin, Gothic and Lombardic, he spoke Norwegian, Swedish and Danish. Tolkien also had a very good command of Old Icelandic, but also modern and medieval Welsh. He also studied Finnish uh, in both its ancient and its modern forms. Uh, and this is important because it was language which was the driving force for all of Tolkien's creations. Tolkien's inspiration simply was language, and he wanted to create a world where people spoke the languages that he'd invented. The Lord of the Rings is a very, very big book, I mean, in, in three volumes. I think it's about three quarters of a million words. It was eventually published in one big, fat paperback. Uh, but it, the point is, it took him 12 years to write it, and that wasn't actually very long, considering how much thinking had to go into it. The resulting book is, is actually probably, I should think, the longest book in the English language which people really do read again and again and again. Well, I think it's, above all, a marvellous story which holds your attention and which creates a totally absolute um, convincing world and that if you're fortunate enough to be able to read large chunks of it at a time which one perhaps can't do very often um, you then can feel yourself totally in that world totally convinced by it the lord of the rings got written mostly during the war years and a great deal of it was written when he was on air raid warden duty at night. He used to cause slight disturbances to the Oxford air raid warden because he forgot to ring up his superior officer to say he hadn't been bombed. John Ronald Ruel Tolkien's family had originally hailed from Germany, hence the unusual surname. Tolkien is thought to be an anglicised version of the common German surname Tolkien. But by the time of Tolkien's birth, the Tolkiens had been in England for almost two centuries. Tolkien's hobbits are a subject in themselves that can occupy you for a very long time once you start looking at them closely. The whole landscape of their native region of Middle-earth, the Shire and Hobbiton, uh, has been recognised by many, many readers and critics as being enormously English, more English than any other bit of Middle-earth that you could look to. Yes, in the character of the hobbits, Tolkien was trying to explore qualities of Englishness, I think, I think many critics have recognised. They are, at their best, plucky, humble, down-to-earth characters. At their worst, they are stubborn, pig-headed, country bumpkins, uh, intensely parochial in their outlook, who haven't a clue what's going on in the wider world. The Fellowship of the Ring takes us into the world of the rings in a singular way. The gentle and leisurely opening acquaints its readers with the thoughts, mannerisms and perspectives of its main protagonists, the Hobbits. By adopting the vantage of the little person, quite literally, Tolkien gives his story nuance and subtlety. And the affairs of Hobbits have gone on to be of great concern to millions worldwide. The brothers Greg and Tim Hildebrand have spent many years illustrating the world of Middle-earth, and like thousands of others, they first fell under Tolkien's magical spell after reading The Hobbit. We, we were in New York making documentary films in about 1965, this was. And I happened to be painting on a, a little scene of this little dwarf skipping over a bridge towards this uh, maple tree, all gnarly and everything, a lot of detail. And a girl that worked in the office came in and looked at it and said, that reminds me of The Hobbit. I said, what's A Hobbit? So the next day she brought in the book, gave it to me, loaned it to me, went right through it in about a day, was hooked instantly, read all three of the next 
the Lord of the Rings books, and I was hooked instantly. I wanted to illustrate that in some way. This is where I take over with him. I said, all right, God damn it. You want to do this thing? I want to do this thing? We're going to do this thing. I mean, then it just like the whole thing cranked up. I, I said that bigger, bigger, this bigger, bigger, and they kept getting bigger, and they had taken longer to do, and longer to do, and I had no thought or care or concern about reality like that, you know, in terms of because we spent the whole year on on what fourteen paintings. Yeah, there have been twenty six translations into other languages of the Hobbit and twenty of the Lord of the Rings, but um, I I would say that he is both popular and unpopular across the board. Uh, because there are those who deeply dislike uh, the Lord of the Rings and all it stands for. Uh, there are those who are passionately addicted to it. And I think it is because it always rouses strong opinions uh, that uh, you get this uh, extreme of expression and of like and of dislike. People were like, go, go Gandalf buttons. Frodo lives. You know, Gandalf for president. You know, um, and, and this, all this sort of thing, and a lot of it was just tone in cheek. In 1891, Tolkien's father Arthur had moved the family to Bloemfontein, where he had found work with the Bank of South Africa. Unfortunately, Tolkien's mother Mabel enjoyed only fragile health, and she could not adapt to conditions in Africa. Accordingly, in 1894, while work detained Arthur in Bloemfontein. Mabel brought Tolkien and his infant brother Hilary back to live in England. Sadly, Tolkien's father would never rejoin the family, as he died after a short illness in 1896. All of Tolkien's work was steeped in a deep sense of melancholy that Tolkien felt reflected aspects of his own life to a great extent. His mother's early death, uh, his experiences in the First World War, both as a soldier in the trenches and afterwards when he had to cope with the fact that nearly all of his childhood friends had been killed, all left him with a, with a deep sense of life's inherent tragedy. This was only reinforced then by his readings of Old English literature, which is itself deeply informed by a tragic sense of life as well. In Tolkien's fantastic world, Middle-earth already has a history far greater than the events described in The Hobbit. Tolkien conceived of Middle-earth not as another world, but as this world at an earlier stage in its geological history. Tolkien had a great knowledge and love for the, the mythology and the literature of the Dark Ages. He was intimately familiar with the Icelandic Eddas, the Norse and German traditions, and of course his own particular specialism was Old English literature and particularly the great poem Beowulf. Most of the poetry of the Anglo-Saxons that Tolkien was interested in focuses quite specifically and deliberately on that juncture between the pagan past and the Christian present. And Tolkien prized that sensibility in Beowulf. His sense of what moved the Beowulf poet in his imagination was precisely that sense of these characters in the deep past who were so excellent and so doomed. set himself a certain imaginative pattern in his adolescence, which consisted chiefly of his absorption in Anglo-Saxon and Middle English and other early Germanic languages, and that led him eventually to writing The Lord of the Rings. He wasn't, you see, though, setting out to write a great book himself. This is a very important point. What he was setting out to do was to create a kind of something private in the back garden or in the loft. It's a hobby much more like model railways than writing. He was very well first in the saga literature of the Scandinavian peoples, but he felt himself first and foremost to be an Englishman. And what he was aware of more than anything else was that England seemed to lack a native mythology. 
It uh, had the Arthurian legends, but these to Tolkien were largely imported French productions, even though they had, did have some native elements. But those native elements are largely Celtic rather than Anglo-Saxon. And so he felt there was a gap uh, where the English psyche itself seemed to lack a national literature that could feed its imagination in a certain way. And at points, more unguarded than usual, he did claim again in letters that uh, he was trying to create a mythology for the, specifically for the English imagination. Tolkien made it very clear that Middle-earth is, is somewhere in this world, and actually he made it clear it's specifically the northwest of the old world, so it's Europe. And uh, it's not on a different planet, it's this world in a very, very early time much earlier period of, of prehistory. Tolkien carefully evoked these legends in his other great work, The Silmarillion. He was constantly writing, then putting aside or rewriting and storing it away. In fact, more has been published by Tolkien since his death than was published in his lifetime. Uh, because so much was in fact unfinished business, put away in box files. He worked for years and years at the Silmarillion, the big collection of myths and legends about Middle-earth, and never intended, I think, to publish it at all, because um, he began work on it about 1917. He was still at work on it ten years later, and he'd showed no signs of wanting to publish it, or even really finish it. He never offered it to a publisher, he never shown it to more than a tiny handful of people, and then very cautiously. From that source, we learn that by the time of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, Middle-earth had already undergone enormous geological upheavals as a result of the calamities that closed the first and second ages. So, in its general features, the setting of the Lord of the Rings resembles the geography and climates of Europe. A long coastline facing a broad sea to the west, backed by hill lands, fertile plains and rugged mountain ranges, bounded by a region of subarctic cold to the north and one of subtropical warmth to the south. Tucked away in a northwestern corner of Middle Earth is the Shire, a land of cultivated fields, hedgerows, woodland and villages, resembling very closely the countryside of England's West Midlands, where Tolkien spent his early childhood. The Shire is a sort of never, never land rural England, somewhere between 1750 and 1900. And, you know, to a certain extent he was draw drawing on his own experience because he, in, in his childhood, particularly and his young manhood, a bit of experience of the countryside. With the financial help of her family, Mabel was initially able to raise the boys here, in rural Warwickshire. Much of the county Tolkien knew has now been swallowed up by the urban sprawl of Birmingham, but in the 1890s, the gentle fields and streams were still a pastoral idyll, which left a huge impact on the young Tolkien. Hobbiton is the central village of the Shire, and Bilbo Baggins is Bag End, one of its principal dwellings. Several of its larger establishments are mentioned in the text, among them the water-driven mill, operated by a hobbit named Ted Sandyman, and an inn and public house called the Green Dragon, whose ale enjoys a very high reputation among hobbits. Like Dr. Johnson before him, Tolkien loved the simple comforts of a good tavern. For him, it was a place to smoke his pipe, enjoy good conversation and, and good beer. So the inns and pubs of England were very important to him and, and they're transported directly to Middle Earth, complete with the names like the Green Dragon, the Prancing Pony, the Golden Perch. Uh, they're beginning to disappear now, but Frodo and Sam would still feel very much at home in the, the traditional pubs around Warwickshire and Oxford. actually remember him telling the stories which were later incorporated into the Lord of the Rings. I think my older brothers um, do remember this being, being that much older. The Lord of the Rings opens as Bilbo Baggins, the hero of The Hobbit, and his nephew Frodo Baggins are about to celebrate their joint birthday with a lavish party that promises to be the most eagerly awaited social event in living memory 
for the hobbits of the Shire. Bilbo has been enjoying a quiet retirement, writing the book in which he will record his own adventures and something of the history of hobbits. Bilbo in, in The Lord of the Rings is very different from Bilbo in The Hobbit. I mean, he, for a start, he's a lot older, despite the fact that he's been so well preserved. You know, he's talking already in chapter one, he's talking like an old man. So he's an avuncular sort of figure who stays in the background. Uh, I think Gandalf says at one point uh, he, he doesn't want uh, Bilbo tottering around in the wild where the enemy would make mincemeat of him, uh, which is fine. Both Bilbo and Frodo were considered rather eccentric and a bit, on, a bit toward the aristocratic side in the Hobbit clans. And then on a personal level they were very unusual uh, because uh, Bilbo, as far as I know, is the only character to ever have voluntarily relinquished the ring, which is an extraordinary thing to do. And if you remember, it was the fact that Bilbo didn't kill Gollum when he could have that set this very important precedent of pity and mercy. <laughs> as Frodo settles into his role as the new owner of Bag End, until one late summer afternoon when Gandalf reappears. He has come to warn Frodo about what he has learned of the ring. As Gandalf had suspected, it is an instrument of far greater power than Bilbo had ever dreamed. The more Gandalf realises the seriousness of what is going on with respect to the ring, in other words, what the ring really is, which takes quite a while, um, the more the awfulness of the situation becomes apparent to him. And for a long time, Gandalf is the only character who really appreciates the gravity of the situation and, and the thread upon which everything hangs. So I think, you know, the, the cares of the world hang very heavily on, on Gandalf. And he sort of visibly ages, really, as the Fellowship of the Ring proceeds. Long before the events we are dealing with, during the Second Age of Middle-earth, Sauron sought to ensnare the elves, men and dwarves who opposed him. He did so by offering the secret of making rings of power. Three for the elves, seven for the dwarves, and nine for men. During the last alliance of elves and men, which defeated Sauron and brought the Second Age to a close, the One Ring was taken from him by Isildur. It should have been destroyed, but Isildur claimed the ring for his own. Before he could return to his kingdom of Gondor, it slipped from his finger. He was killed by orcs, and the ring sank to the bottom of the river. It had come to Gollum, and then found its way to Bilbo. Gandalf warns Frodo that Sauron is aware that his ring has been found by a hobbit and that his ring wraiths will soon be scouring Middle-earth for a place called the Shire and a hobbit called Baggins. He advises Frodo to set out soon for Rivendell where the elf lord Elrond can give him both shelter and advice. First of all, you get this whole background of all this nasty stuff going on and all the heroic stuff as well and you know and the big perspectives opening out from what has you know been this sort of quite narrow little cozy world you know and even by comparison the world of the hobbit is relatively narrow and cozy and then you get the journey which is a journey in various senses to Rivendell where in Frodo he takes a character who begins a pretty classic hobbit and yet through his experience and through virtues of his own that allow him to respond to that experience, he moves into a wider world and is able to transcend himself in a fashion. Uh, Sam never quite does, although from the more rustic end of that spectrum, he moves a great deal forward as well. Sam is definitely a peasant. Yeah, he's, uh, to quote Ursula Le Guin, you know, is what she felt, feels that if Sam says Yes, Mr. Frodo, once more. Um, you know, she has wild ideas of starting a Hobbit Socialist Party. 
I wouldn't go so far as to call Sam a peasant. I think it's important to recognise that Tolkien had served in the army during the Great War, and to me he seems to be presenting a portrait of something that has the relationship between a, a worthy officer and, a, and his dependable Batman. It's based on a shared sense of duty. Uh, and remember that Sam is free to withdraw from the relationship at any time, and this temptation becomes particularly strong during the meeting with Galadriel, and it's this willingness to freely carry on with the quest which makes Sam such a noble character. After their first encounter with the Black Riders, the Hobbits leave the road, turning south through the open lands of East Farthing and the forest of Woody End, emerging on a rise above the Marish. Crossing the lands of Farmer Maggot, they find unexpected aid from the farmer. Maggot has encountered the Black Riders and agrees to help the Hobbits. After the terrors of the road, the simple comforts of the farmhouse and the farmer's hospitality revitalise the Hobbits. Throughout the trilogy, Tolkien employs a, a repeated pattern of action. First, a character makes a mistake, which directly produces a dangerous situation. These situations are then resolved by unlooked for help and are followed always by an interlude of safety, rest and comfort, usually during which counsel is taken. Um, we see this pattern repeat five or six times in the Fellowship, and it occurs first in the Shire, where Frodo delays setting off on the journey. This leads to the dangerous situation with the Black Riders. The Hobbits then receive unexpected help from a party of elves led by Gildor, and they take advice from them. Under the cover of fog and darkness, the hobbits proceed in Farmer Maggot's cart to the Buckleberry Ferry across the Brandywine River. On the other side, they are joined by Pippin and stay the night in Frodo's new house in Buckland on the western edge of the old forest. Next morning, they decide to shake off the riders by setting off into the old forest, which abuts the eastern boundary of the Shire. Some of the trees of the old forest possess a sentient life of their own, which is hostile to two-legged life and expresses its enmity by waylaying travellers with suddenly shifting paths and falling branches. The hobbits find themselves forced against their will deeper into the forest than they plan to go, and at its heart they find themselves suddenly falling asleep beneath an ancient willow. Well, Tolkien loved trees with a passion. Uh, he said he loved them the way some people liked uh, or loved animals. Um, he described himself as a defender of trees against all their enemies. And there are strong individual trees in the Lord of the Rings that have their own, that are their own characters. Um, I think th the interesting thing about Old Man Willow is that he shows that Tolkien wasn't necessarily romanticizing nature. He didn't present a purely rosy-tinted romantic image of the natural world. Uh, he showed that nature can be, as far as we are concerned, extremely hostile. As Ted Hughes aptly put it, nature is red in tooth and claw. And although forests such as Fangorn and Lothlorien are frequently presented by Tolkien as places where the characters can escape to and then find concealment and safety and regeneration, he also presents the reverse side, where the trees provide concealment for evil deeds and, and, and menace. And the old forest is an example of that. And we also learn that Sauron once had his own stronghold in Mirkwood. So it's not all tree-hugging by any means. Sam fights his drowsiness long enough to see Frodo being held under the water by a branch. Sam rescues Frodo, and they discover the other hobbits trapped within the willow trunk. Crying out in distress, Frodo and Sam hear an unlikely voice singing a merry song. Into the clearing comes an extraordinary figure, 
short, stocky and bearded, in yellow boots and a blue coat. With amiable nonchalance, he introduces himself as Tom Bombadil and offers to free Mary and Pippin from the clutches of old man Willow, which he does by whispering into the cracks that have closed over the hobbits. Bombadil offers the hobbits the shelter of his house, which they gratefully accept. In Bombadil's house, they are entertained by Tom and his wife, Goldberry, the river daughter, as he calls her. Well, Tom Bombadil doesn't completely fit into the rest of the Fellowship of the Ring very comfortably. He, in fact, as it were, wandered into the story from another story that uh, Tolkien was working on. He's a strange um, anomaly, really. He's a reminder of something very, very much older, uh, which is being left behind, even in the story of The Fellowship of the Ring. Tom Bombard, it's, it's, in a sense, what you're getting in those early chapters of The Lord of the Rings is moving away from this cosy shire, which is almost, you know, the children's story type of thing, and you're moving into a much deeper and darker world and much more grim, heroic legend type of world. And, in a sense, Tom Bombadil is a mediating character in that. And he's also building up this extra historical dimension, this perspective, broadening out the world, adding more leaves to the tree and to use a metaphor Tolkien uses elsewhere. To reach Bree, the hobbits must cross the Barrow Downs, a stretch of desolate and ancient burial mounds, some of them crowned by derelict rings of standing stones that are the tombs of kings of men from the Second Age. Taking their leave of Bombadil, the hobbits press on, but stop for lunch near a great monolith, where they fall asleep unexpectedly. The hobbits become lost and separated. Frodo hears the others crying for help in the distance and is confronted by a looming, shadowy figure with piercing eyes. He realises they have been taken by Barrow Whites, evil spirits thought to haunt the Downs. They are again rescued by Bombadil, who leads the hobbits from the chamber into the open air. I find it a little hard to understand why Tolkien wouldn't make more use, as it were, of stone circles and ancient monuments in a sort of positive way, actually. They, they come across in a very kind of negative way, as if they're sort of atavistic uh, uh, things from the past, uh, perhaps so clearly pre-Christian that he, uh, he wasn't that keen on them. That would be my speculation. The Beowulf poet was writing out of some pretty peculiar circumstances as far as we can work them out. He was himself a Christian, uh, at an early stage in the conversion of the Anglo-Saxons to Christianity, an Anglo-Saxon culture traditionally, going way back into prehistory, was focused very much on a deep regard for the past, for ancestors, for ancestry and lineage. And it was obvious from the historical record that one of the great difficulties the Anglo-Saxons felt in coming to terms with their conversion was the fact that this new faith they took to quite enthusiastically also required them to consign those ancestors whom they regarded so with such great regard to hell. And it's rather unflinching in many ways. It looks at the hopelessness of that pagan past. It's thoroughly Christian in its attitudes and recognizes that these benighted heathens, however special they were to the Anglo-Saxons as Anglo-Saxons, lived confronting forces in the universe that they could not cope with and that would eventually get them in the end. At the Prancing Pony, they are met by a tall, weather-beaten man called Strider, a ranger of the north. He is one of a small band of men who scout the wild lands, pursuing the servants of Sauron. Frodo decides to trust Strider, who reveals that he knows of their quest and offers to help them. Strider, or Aragorn as we later know him, doesn't really change as a character throughout The Lord of the Rings. In fact, he's often singled out by the book's critics as the most wooden and two-dimensional of its major figures. It's one of the things that critics most often fail to recognise. This is not supposed to be a modern novel. It was inspired in homage to the great ancient sagas 
and the writing style is deliberately crafted to invoke something of the atmosphere of Beowulf or the Icelandic Eddas, and Tolkien loved those. Obviously there are modern aspects in the use of the extensive descriptions and dialogue, but Tolkien gives us very little insight into the thoughts of the characters. In the tradition of a heroic saga, it's the actions of the characters which are important. And in the world of Middle-earth, character is revealed in action. You could see Strider as a bit two-dimensional, but I would feel a bit of, a bit sorry for him in that respect, because uh, I think he, he, he's clearly an individual with a particular personal history. and But at the same time, he has this role, this role as the future king that he has to fill and is trying to fill and it's a very demanding role. Um, it involves him spending years and years in the wild becoming ever more weather-beaten uh, and antisocial and also long years of denial in relation to his uh, the love of his life, Arwen. Uh, because un uh, unless he does become the king, he won't you know, be worthy of her love, because after all, she is an elf, and not just any elf. Um, so I don't see Strider as, as uh, too s simple a character, but I do see him as being dominated, his whole life is being dominated by this one mission which he's striving to accomplish. And I suppose that has a simplifying effect, but it would on anyone. It is the way he is perceived that, and it is as he gradually reveals more of himself, that, you know, where he starts off as just this rather dodgy looking ranger, but very quickly becomes, you know, sort of a re very reliable companion, and so forth. And, you know, there he is really, you know, proving himself as much to people outside as to himself. With Strider as their guide, the party sets off for Rivendell. Strider proposes to lead them through wild lands away from the East Road to avoid the Ringwraith's pursuit. They make slow progress, and danger follows close behind. In the meantime, Gandalf has reached Bree, and by sticking to the road he overtakes the group. Gandalf has an encounter with the Ringwraith's, and has to make a long circuit north to draw off pursuit. Gandalf is only partially successful. Some of the riders do follow him, but several evenings into their journey, at the same old watchtower on the top of Weathertop Hill, the Hobbits and Strider are attacked in their camp by five ringwraiths. Tolkien writes there is a seed of courage uh, in the fattest and most timid Hobbit. Uh, waiting for the right circumstances to to emerge, and uh, I think it is in Weathertop where we first see the the ability of the hobbits to to take on a very serious life and death situation and respond bravely. Um, it's also where the nature of the Black Riders becomes entirely clear and the power that they have, and uh, where Aragorn's uh, role, uh, personal bravery as well, uh, comes to the forefront. Um, they have to manage without the help of Gandalf. That's, I think, interesting. They cannot, you know, they are denied any magical rescue. As they negotiate the difficult terrain, drawing nearer to Rivendell, they are met by the elf lord, Glorfindel, who has been dispatched to search for the ring bearer and help him to reach Elrond's sanctuary. Putting Frodo on his horse, Glorfindel urges them on, aware that the ring wraiths are not far behind. In a final race, they reach the fords of the river Bruenen that mark the boundary of Rivendell. Just at that moment, all nine ring wraiths break cover, bearing down on Frodo. Glorfindel commands his horse to bear Frodo on across the fords as he and Aragorn prepare to face the Black Riders. They call to Frodo across the river to come with them back to Mordor. Terribly weakened, he refuses. But as the ring wraiths begin to ride across the ford, the river rises against them, sending a destructive cataract that overwhelms their steeds 
and destroys the forms they have taken for their mission. The passage describing Gorfindel's arrival and the defense uh, that he and Aragorn give uh, against the Black Riders at the Ford um, is one of my favorite in the book. Um, uh, when Frodo has the ring on, he sees Glorfindel as a shining white presence. He can't see any of the other hobbits or people. He can only, the only other thing he sees clearly is the flame of the, uh, the brands, the flaming brands that are, they are holding. So he's seeing things more or less as the Black Riders are, because he's wearing the ring. And what he sees is a spiritual being um, of, of great, and from the Black Riders' point of view, terrible uh, power uh, in both that world, as it were, in the spiritual world, and in the so-called real world that we see daily. Um, so an elf, as it were, lives in both worlds at the same time. The elves are among Middle-earth's oldest inhabitants. Their origins traceable back to before the first age, before the creation of the sun and the moon, when only stars shone in the skies of the newly created world. Now, much reduced in number, the elves of Middle-earth live in a state of perpetual, mournful awareness of their past sufferings and losses. The elves are obviously very important characters in The Lord of the Rings. Um, they may come as a shock to readers initially because they have nothing to do with uh, diminutive fairies and elves in that sense that we're all familiar with from Shakespeare. And of course that's one of the things that Tolkien held against Shakespeare. Uh, because the elves for Tolkien related more uh, to uh, quasi-supernatural beings in Celtic mythology, for example, or Germanic mythology, who had human stature and human form, but extraordinary longevity and great powers uh, that human beings didn't have. Tolkien actually created not one but two Elvish languages. Firstly, there was Quenya or High Elvish. This was supposed to be the language of the, the elven nobility, the High Elves and was rarely spoken except on solemn or firm, formal occasions. Um, Tolkien compared it to Latin in our world. Uh, the sounds and structure of Quenya are delivered from Greek and Finnish, two languages that Tolkien particularly enjoyed, but most of the elves in the books speak a more modern language known as Sindarin, which Tolkien based on the sounds and structure of Old Welsh. We see it in names like Galadriel, Arwen and Rivendell. The hobbits are summoned to a council at which the question of what to do with the ring is to be decided. After much debate, it is decided that the ring must be destroyed. But the only way to destroy the ring will be to cast it into the fires in which Sauron first forged it, inside the fires of Oradun, Mount Doom. I think the council is interesting because as it unf unfolds, it, 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 it becomes very clear how difficult it is for people, and in particular human beings present, but also even some of the elves who are supposed to be so wise, to understand the idea that this is a weapon that cannot be used, that uh, the only way to handle the ring is not to handle it, where the commonsensical um, solution is obviously to uh, take it and use it against the enemy. I mean, that would be a perfectly sensible thing to do and a also perfectly wrong thing to do. And that emerges very nicely in the course of the council. When Gandalf reveals the real nature of the ring and Gollum's part in the affair, Frodo remarks that it was a pity that Bilbo hadn't killed Gollum. This is the cue for one of the best exchanges in the book because Gandalf rounds on him and he says it was pity that stayed his hand, pity and mercy. And when Frodo responds that he still feels that Gollum deserved death, Gandalf goes on to say many that live deserve death and some that die deserves life. 
And then he challenges Frodo. He says, can you give it to them? Then don't be too eager to deal out death and judgment. It's, it's a short and very powerful passage, and it handles that theme as en- elegantly as anything you'll find in Measure for Measure or The Merchant of Venice. Though they choose, in the end, to seek its destruction, the means at their disposal make the attempt seem, in the words of one elf lord, a bitter jest. One of the things about Sauron that, that is most striking is that we never see him, of course. And I think that's quite a clever move on Tolkien's part, uh, because if you can see a figure, he becomes in some way delimited and sort of more manageable on that account. So we're left to imagine Sauron, and, and for that reason he becomes in our minds more of a straightforward power, a pure power of evil. The council delegates a party of nine to take the ring south in secret. Against the nine black riders will go nine companions. Frodo will carry on as the ring bearer. With him go Gandalf and Strider. Also representing men is Boromir, son of the steward Denethor of Gondor, the southern kingdom founded by Erendil. Representing the dwarves is Gimli, and for the elves goes Legolas. The remaining three places Elrond meant to be filled with elf lords of his household. But Merry, Pippin and Sam refuse to be parted from Frodo, and Gandalf unexpectedly seconds their plea to join the company, suggesting that Elrond should trust more to their love for their friend than to the counsels of prudence. What emerged out of the council was, of course, the Fellowship of the Ring. That's where the uh, composition of the Fellowship was decided. Tolkien makes it clear that this, these sorts of alliances were very difficult uh, to get going. They were cobbled together among uh, groups of people who were extremely different in their orientations to life, in their values, uh, and that's the sort of alliance that is needed to take on Sauron. But its chief architect is Gandalf, and even Gandalf barely pulled it off, where the mutual interest of each of these, so to speak, races of people in opposing the ring is just enough to hold the fellowship together for as long as it lasted. Although the Lord of the Rings isn't allegorical, I think it must have at least been subliminally influenced by the recent events of the Second World War. Because Tolkien presents such a convincing picture of the difficulties of of coalition warfare. The enemy is united as the result of Sauron's totalitarianism, but the other peoples are free, and Gandalf therefore has the the problem of of bringing together a coalition of the Ents and Rohan and Gondor, and he then has to provide the impetus to fight and to maintain the cohesion across a large and a complex strategic situation. It's not a representation of the Second World War, but it is Middle Earth's equivalent of a world war, with Gandalf, if you, if you must, as the equivalent of a Churchill and a Montgomery combined. The party sets off south through the empty lands to the west of the Misty Mountains. Their first course is to cross the mountains through a high pass. But on Mount Caradras, they are defeated by a sudden snowstorm which nearly kills them. Against Aragorn's judgment, Gandalf persuades them to cross the mountains by passing under them through the mines of Moria, a massive underground assemblage of tunnels, mines and magnificent halls first excavated by the dwarves. Well, I think in in taking such a tortuous route to the mines of Moria, um, Tolkien was making it clear that there was a a kind of fated element in going to Moria. Everything conspired, circumstances conspired to drive them into Moria. It's as if they had to go that way, and in particular Gandalf had to go that way. And Aragorn was very unhappy about that route because he had a premonition that something would happen to Gandalf if they did. But, of course, they were left with no choice. 
Tolkien tells us in Appendix B that Gandalf is a Maya, or a servant of the gods, and in the text Gandalf significantly describes himself as, at one stage, having been sent back to Middle-earth. He's one of the five Istari, or, or wizards. Uh, we meet two of the others in the book in the form of Radagast the Brown and Saruman. And in the mythology of Middle-earth, it's interesting because Sauron is also a very powerful Maya. But Sauron was in the service to Melkor, who's a kind of Lucifer figure, to borrow the, the Christian analogy. He fell from grace and he became Morgoth. The Balrog is also a Maya of Morgoth, which has survived from the, the first age of Middle-earth. In silence and fearful darkness, the company makes its way through the tunnels and ruined halls. Nearing the other side, they come to a great chamber with deep window shafts that admit daylight, and there they find the tomb of Balin. It seems that Balin and his people have been killed by orcs, but something even darker is hinted at. As they read of the last days of the dwarf colony in a tattered chronicle left lying in the dust near the tomb, they are startled by a booming of a great drum and the sound of orc voices. They are nearly trapped, but fight their way down to a hall before the eastern gates of Moria, where they need only cross a narrow bridge across a deep crevice to escape. The company is overtaken by a Balrog, an evil fire spirit. The Balrog is a survivor of the many that served Morgoth during his wars with the elves in the first age of Middle-earth. You get these Balrogs who are these sort of great big um, demons, basically. And, and he brings one in, this, you know, to explain why, you know, what happened to Moria, without directly bringing Sauron into it. Although these guys are working on Sauron's side, definitely, the, the Balrogs. Gandalf confronts the Balrog. As he does so, he commands the others to cross behind him. Standing at the center of the span over the abyss, he shatters it with his staff as the Balrog tries to cross, sending the demon hurtling downwards. But a thong of its whip curls around Gandalf's leg as it falls, dragging him to the brink and over. With his last words, he bids the other members of the company to flee. Oh, I think the, the, the fight between Gandalf and the Balrog on the bridge at khazad is one of the most dramatic parts of any of the three books uh, of The Lord of the Rings. And uh, Gandalf makes it clear in what he says that he is uh, an emissary, a representative of a higher power for good. And by implication, the Balrog is uh, for, for evil. Um, so it's a you know it's a pretty clear cut contest, but then when they both fall, they both uh, the bridge breaks and they both go down. Um, Gandalf's last words, of course, are "Fly, you fools," which is a very uh, personal, idiosyncratic Gandalfian touch because he was very irascible. As a, as a character, as a mundane character, and that's just the sort of thing that he would have said. So, you know, he's not just uh, a sort of one-dimensional representation of good, he's also a particular character, which is encapsulated in his last moment on the bridge, which I think is a very nice touch. <laughs> escape through the eastern gate and make their way towards Lothlorien. This secret forest is one of the great retreats and refuges of the elves in the latter days of the Third Age. Its trees, 
dominated by the white-barked, golden-leafed marron, and its climate is one of a perpetual spring. The citadel of the elves is the great tree of Carus Gladhorn. And the characteristic of the elves in Lothlorien is enchantment. Um, Tolkien drew this really interesting distinction between enchantment and magic. This is mostly in an essay on fairy stories that he wrote, but he carries it out in The Fellowship of the Ring and his other books as well. Uh, enchantment is characterized by wonder, and it has no purpose as such, although it can have real, very significant effects in the real world. It's not accomplished in order to make something else happen. Whereas magic, he says, is, exists as an exercise of will and power, and its goal is to make something happen in the world, change something, do something, dominate people and things in order to make something happen. So obviously Sauron is the greatest magician in Middle-earth. Well, the elves' power, you see, was quite different. It wasn't really magic as such. It was enchantment. It was the opportunity they gave to other people in the story, and therefore to Tolkien's readers, to experience the world as an, an enchanted place. Galadriel is the owner of one of the great elven rings. It is this ring which helps to preserve the land of Lorien. She is offered the ring, but of course, as she says, she passes the test, because it, it is a moral test. Uh, she declines the ring. And she's quite an ambiguous uh, character. She's a very com complex and, uh, and dangerous character in some ways. Galadriel is a strong female character, and as such, she plainly contradicts the many critics who feel that Tolkien was in some way writing only for men and about men. Galadriel's, in many ways, the most distanced character of them all. She is, of course, easily the most august character in the whole cast, perhaps apart from Sauron himself. She is um, one of the oldest living elves in Middle-earth. She's been there from the very beginning. Uh, if you have a look at the history of how Tolkien came to write the text that now exists in the Silmarillion, he altered and shifted his conception of Galadriel very, very much along the way. Without going into details, he essentially makes her more and more rarefied and, it has to be said, Virgin Mary-like. She's almost a, a figure of quasi-religious veneration by the, end, but by, by the time he's writing her up in The Lord of the Rings. When Galadriel shows Sam's vision of the Shire being devastated, yeah, he's saying, oh, I wish you'd, you know, take my master's ring and, you know, do, um, and do what he says and take over, you'd, you'd stop people. And, and then when he briefly has to bear the ring himself later on, and when he's seen what it's done to Gollum, what it is doing to Frodo, you know, then, you know, you get a bit of his bro a broadening, you know, he's, he is not such a smug, insular little hobbit anymore. At their parting, Galadriel offers the travellers a number of gifts. Among them are three boats, which will allow them to continue their southward journey on the waters of the River Anduin. They follow the river past the two huge stone statues of the old kings of Gondor, to a point just above the falls of Ralos, where they must leave the river and decide their next path. Frodo goes off on his own to ponder his choices, and Boromir follows him furtively. But at that moment, the company is attacked by a raiding party of orcs and scattered.
Boromir's death is a, a tragedy in the Shakespearean sense of the word. He's a nobleman who brings about his own death as a result of his own actions. He only really appears in one of the six books which make up the Lord of the Rings, but he has a great impact as his story is a kind of tale within a tale. No, Boromir succumbs. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite tragic what happens with Boromir. And he realises in the end what he's done, of course. But at the same time, you could say that the stimulus of him doing that was precisely what was needed to actually pack Frodo and Sam off on their mission. And that without that, they might have been, you know, too weak to, to get going. They might have felt too tempted to stay with their friends, go to the temporary safety of Minas Tirith, and that would have been fatal. Frodo makes his way back to the boats, having resolved to set out alone. But Sam, in the meantime, had realized what Frodo would choose and follows him. Together they set off to take the ring to Mordor and the next phase of the journey. Mm -hmm.